So let's take a moment and visualize. Most important thing, I think, with data is to get a sense of what the data is telling you, the best first step, and every data scientist that's worth their salt will tell you this, the best first thing to do is just plot it. Get a scatter plot of this data out. Um, and that should tell you at least the beginnings of a story uh, that that data is, is hinting at. But the choices that we make in, in producing that scatter plot are important. Um, and the first choice that's not so obvious, uh, but that's actually going to help us a little bit down the line, is that when we make our scatter plot, we have to choose a variable to plot on the horizontal axis, the x-axis, and we also have to choose one for the vertical axis, the y-axis. And for our project, we're actually going to make the quantities our x-values and the prices our y-values. So when it comes time to actually doing this plot, we're going to put the prices into the y-column and the quantities in the x-column. So in my Excel, what I'll just do is I'll just copy and paste just another copy of my price data just paste the values over here in another column. So that in my scatter plot, these are going to be my x's, those are going to be my y's. And then Excel being Excel, uh, they make it fairly simple to just generate a scatter plot. We'll just highlight our data, our two column data, insert tab, uh, head over to charts. Where are my charts? Recommended charts. Uh, yeah, sure. I don't know if I want recommended charts, actually. Um, I'm going to choose the scatter plot drop down. Um, and choose a scatter plot that doesn't actually connect the lines one to another, just shows us the, the points as a scatter. And what we get is a kind of crude scatter plot uh, of what this marketing data is trying to tell us. I'm going to kind of locate it over here in the, in the corner. <laughs> What's one story that you can tell based on this scatter plot so far? What's the first thing you notice about this marketing data? The lowest price has the highest quantity and vice versa. And after all, we expected that, right? That's generally what happens in marketing. When the price goes up, the number of sales tends to go down. So that's the first story that I think is, is evident from the downward trend in these data points. Um, anything else that you can see from this? Let me ask this question. Is the way in which, uh, let me put some labels on the axes here. That's one thing I wish Excel did. This horizontal axis here is the quantity sold in thousands. The vertical axis here is the price per unit. So here's a question. Is the rate at which the quantity decreases as we, sorry, is the rate at which the price decreases as we increase the quantity, is that rate consistent? No. How can you tell? It's not linear. It's not quite linear, right? That one way of saying that is that I can't really draw a single straight line that passes through all five of these data points. Exactly, right? But it's probably the case that we could do fairly well drawing a line that mostly kind of connects all those various data points. Um, so that downward trend is there, but it's not perfectly consistent, right? It doesn't decrease at a constant rate. It doesn't, those points don't lie along a straight line. Um, and so what that suggests to us is that if we want to build a model for the relationship between price and quantity, if we want to get a function, an algebraic function, whose graph passes as neatly through these data points as possible, this graph would be something like y equals f of x, except that here, the role of x is being played by the quantity, q, and the role of y is being played by the price, p. If we want to create a function that models this behavior as well as possible, a, a perfect linear function isn't going to do it exactly. Um, even a perfect quadratic function whose graph would be a parabola is not going to do this exactly. Um, there's probably not a function in the world that we would want to work with that's going to pass exactly through all of this data. Um, and so our job is first going to have to be to do as best we can with the function models that we know to match this data as, as accurately as we can. For that process, we use a statistical technique called a regression. And n this not being a statistics class, uh, we're not going to pop the hood on regression and see how it works and talk about you know, covariance, correlation coefficients, and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're going to use technology to substitute for that, um, that sort of statistical uh, theory. And what that tends to look like I want to make my Excel graph a little bit less misleading. Uh, and to me, the misleading thing about this graph in Excel is look at the y-axis. 
y-axis doesn't actually go all the way down to zero. It's only showing me a little window kind of way up on the y-axis. Um, so if you're using Excel to do this work, um, you can fix that just by right-clicking on the axis, choosing to format the axis. I'm using a Mac, but the controls are very similar on PC. And then just change the minimum bound on that axis down to zero. That way now we're actually seeing the real origin, zero price, zero quantity, down here in the lower left. Um, that's hopefully going to make the, the graph that we see make a little bit more sense in just a moment. And now if I want to fit a function to this data, if I want to ask Excel to deploy a regression to actually do that, in Excel what you can do is just right click on any of the data points that are in your list, and then from the options that come up, choose the option Add Trend Line. Even though it's called a trend line, it doesn't always have to be linear, which is kind of a weird choice of terminology. But if we do choose it to be linear, um, then what we'll see, try and scroll over here, is that Excel will make a little attempt at drawing the best possible dotted line through all of our data. And Excel is pretty conservative. It only draws the line from the first point to the sort of through the first x value to the last x value. Um, we can actually make it extend that line if we want to by asking it to forecast forward or forecast backwards. For example, if I want my line to go all the way back to the vertical axis, let's see, what's my smallest quantity? My smallest quantity is 559. So if I ask it to forecast backwards by 559, it's going to extend that. Whoops, I meant backwards, not forward. Then it's going to draw that line all the way back to the y-axis, which might be kind of a handy little visual. I could also ask it to go as far forward as I like. Uh, let's say I want to go forward another 600 or something like that. So we can kind of make Excel zoom in and zoom out on its regression lines if we want to. Uh, we can also, from this menu, choose different types of function models. If we don't think a straight line is best, we could choose a polynomial of second order, for example. Notice that this is generally going to be a little bit better fit to the data, to any set of data, than a straight line will be. Um, we could get fancy. We could choose a power function, which turns out not to do that good. We could choose a logarithmic function, which also doesn't do that great. An exponential function, yeah, not terrific, but it's not that bad. Um, for the sake of your project, using a polynomial of order 2 is the choice that we're asking you to make. Okay, so this is a choice that, in general, in the authentic context, you will make <laughs> out in the real world. For the sake of the analysis that we do this semester, we're going to choose polynomial degree 2 uh, to do this fitting. The last thing to make sure to do with your regression, if you're using Excel for it, is to tell it to display the regression equation on the chart. Because that is now going to give you the hook. It gives you the equation that describes this curve that is the best fit for the data among all polynomials of degree 2. It gives you an equation for it. And that equation is then going to power the algebra that we do, the, the calculus that we do, everything for the rest of the semester. This equation that you get out of this process is called the demand function for this set of data. Again, the role of the demand function is to relate price to quantity, where quantity here is thought of as my independent variable, my x-axis variable, and price is thought of as my dependent variable, the one on the y-axis, the vertical axis. And so if I'm using q and p as my variables, I would just replace all of my x's from up here with p's instead, minus 0 0.0003 p squared, sorry, q squared, minus 0.1488 times q plus 558.19. And I get an equation that now models for me the relationship between the quantity that I can sell in the national market and the price that I want to charge in the national market for my product couple questions I want to ask now about this model. What is the largest price that I could get away with charging for my product if I want to sell any product at all? What's the highest price point that I could set in this model? Or where would I find that information on this graph? Remember this axis here is quantity. This axis there is price. What's the highest price I can get away with charging? $558.19. So how do you know based on the equation that that's the highest price? 
It's the y-intercept. So on the graph, it's the y-intercept. It's this price right here on the y-axis happens to be the largest possible price. At that price, so when p is equal to 558.19, what is q equal to at that point? Yeah, q at that point is equal to 0. So what's the interpretation of that? If I charge $558.19 per unit in price, how much quantity do I sell? None, exactly. At that point, I have priced myself out of the national market. Nobody wants to buy at that high of a price. So the vertical intercept is going to tell me that right, for my demand function. It's the point at which I have priced myself out of the market. I have zero quantity left. What does the other intercept tell me? So I, I can't get an exact number from the equation out of this just yet. Um, let's say it's, I don't know, 1180 or something like that. What is that intercept going to tell me about the market? That's the quantity. What's the price at that point? Yeah. So what's happening at the, y, at the x-intercept, the horizontal intercept? I'm giving them away, exactly, right. If I, just, if I just flew a plane over my national market and just threw my product out the window, um, how many could I get rid of, right? If I just gave them away for free, how many, how many would I get rid of? Right? How, how much demand is there regardless of price for my product in the national market? Right? So we can get a lot of information just out of this demand function, right? We can figure out, first of all, how to put bounds, boundaries, on the prices that we can charge. There's no way that we're going to charge for this product anything more than $558.19 per unit. Because at that point, we're not going to sell anything anymore. We also know, and we can tell our production team, hey, you don't have to worry about having capacity for this product to produce any more than 1,180,000, 1.18 million, of our products. Because there's no way we could even give away that many per year. So this gives us some, some constraints on the prices that we can charge and the quantities that we can expect to sell in the national market, just from this one equation, the demand function, that relates price to quantity.